like forest area, uh, coastline depletion. Coastline depletion because of raising water levels? Which are like the uh, environmental degradation prediction. So ah, okay. What are the wonderful like coastal areas, things like that? Mm, because of like rising water levels or? Yeah, that kind of stuff. But I don't work on in that field. But right. That's how they do it. The... Yeah, so the applications of AI, whatever that means, are quite broad. Two more minutes and then we'll begin. Because it has happened many times. We started like right, right at the hour and just five minutes, 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes the workshop, people, people start walking in. We'll begin in two more minutes. We'll begin in two more minutes. No? Yeah. We're waiting for you. Okay, in just the less than 60 seconds will begin. I'll quickly tell you about the table of contents. There's just only four of them. And then we'll jump right into it. Very good. So one more time, let me welcome all of you again to the first episode of our data science series. As you know, there will, there's gonna be four of these. This is the first one. Uh, leading up to uh, the end of September, we will have three more of these workshops. With every subsequent workshop, we will go slightly into more of the technicalities of the world of AI and data science. So this is the most broad and overview uh, uh, workshop and then with these subsequent workshop, we'll go into more details. If you're interested, you may want to consider joining your subsequent workshops. Very good. Here's how we will do it. We want to have a clear definition of artificial intelligence. What is fact and what is myth? And once we've done that, we will jump into a concept, a term, a practice, if you like, that is closely related to artificial intelligence. And that is data science. And once we know what data science is, we will jump into the heart of data science, which is machine learning, okay? <coughs> now, of course, whenever you hear the word artificial intelligence, you see it in movies, you see it in articles, you, uh, even if you heard the word, maybe a picture of, a picture of this sort comes into mind, right? This bionic, Mm, humanoid, the robot that um, can talk like a human being, think like a human being, do everything like a human being, except it is, you know, it's not, it's not a biological creature. Everything is electronic. And there are two perceptions. There is this uh, belief that our uh, robots, right, robots with genuine intelligence can become our friends. They can reason like us, they understand sociability and they will be our friends. They can work with us like in the office space, you know, they can help us uh, with our uh, assignments, our jobs. Plus they don't get tired. So, you know, they won't complain. And of course the other perception is no, 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 they're going to, uh, they're, they're going to enslave us. They're going to figure out how bad we humans are. They, they will learn about our history and they will decide, yeah, humans have done enough harm, it's time to take them out. 
and uh, make the world right again. You will end up with Mr. Terminator here. He's going to be coming, guns blazing, come show up at your doorstep, and you know, I will leave it to your imagination. There's a problem with this assumption that we could ever get to this point, or if we are uh, going to get to this point. First, let's categorize artificial intelligence. Okay, there are degrees of sophistication. Okay, so as we go towards the right of the spectrum, we, uh, we, we were looking at more superior, more sophisticated form of artificial intelligence. At the, first, we have narrow artificial, artificial intelligence. Okay, so all of this is relative to human intelligence. Narrow artificial intelligence compared to human intelligence is doing specific tasks independent of human supervision. So things like uh, uh, detecting images, the contents of an image. You, you feed an image, you show an image to this machine and it can tell you this is a tree, this is a face. Here are two eyes and this person is smiling. Or, or, like re, or we can make, talk about very more specific tasks like uh, uh, listening to a sequence of to some sort of sound file and then producing a transcript. So this is the sound I'm hearing. These are the words that are being communicated in the audio file. Uh, another example would be uh, image recognition. We've got, yeah, identifying characters in, the, in handwriting. So if you have a picture or a PDF of handwriting, you can show it to the machine and will tell you these are the characters, this is the letter A, this is the letter B, these are the numbers. Okay, so uh, these are what we humans can do instantaneously, but they're very specific tasks. Then you have something called general AI. General AI is being able to make inferences. Making inferences about things about which you have no prior knowledge and uh, about something that you've had no exposure to previously. So, so that's general AI, and then beyond that is super artificial intelligence. This is where the machine has well intelligence beyond anything that a human can uh, human can acquire. So those robots that you see in, in the previous picture, where they can think like us, act like us, do everything we can do, but better. That assumes that in order for us to ever achieve super AI, to go beyond human intelligence, we must first get the machine to meet us at the same level, okay? That is a prerequisite. If you want to supersede us, you must first be at our level. The problem is in order for you to facilitate, facilitate general AI, make the robot think like us, you must first know how the human brain works to begin with. But we're not, we're still not, we're still not at that point. We, there are many things we don't know about the human brain, so we cannot exactly replicate. It. We know how it works to some extent, but not to the extent that we, to the extent that we can replicate it exactly. We can create a mechanical, electronic, electromechanical brain that works exactly like our biological brain. Again, that's because we don't understand how it works. So AI at its point is still inferior. In fact, we're still at this point. If you see that red, marker, there is where we are. Every example that you've seen, whether it's music recommendation, movie recommendation, how many of you heard of GPT-3? GPT-3, anyone? This is uh, an algorithm that even, about which even Elon Musk has raised uh, alarm. GPT-3 is an algorithm that can do narrow AI, narrow AI and it can do it very impressively. Things like writing articles, producing music, producing poetry, and even creating uh, lifelike pictures to the point where you cannot tell if this is an actual face or if it's a simulation. Even, the, even though these things are quite impressive, they are still specific tasks. They are not examples of intuition. So that is where we are at now. So let me end the uh, now, why do people raise alarm about 
narrow artificial now we will look at examples of narrow artificial intelligence in a second oh why why do people say it is it is ai is dangerous ai is dangerous because well it can it can be both beneficial and dangerous but if it is dangerous or beneficial it is because it can augment human capabilities and anything that can augment human capabilities uh can pose problems like the following, like deforestation. With the introduction of the chainsaw and forklifts, we have problems like deforestation. Other examples include pollution, right? The industrial revolution gave us this problem or mushroom clouds. So anything that can augment human capabilities will make problems like these even worse. So it can either make situations like this problematic. So we have situations like, so right now we have uh, drones, right? Soon enough, we will have uh, drones that can pilot themselves. In fact, to some extent we've achieved that or mechanized infantry. Okay, that you can, so someone can sit, sit in a room like this with remote control like the video game and they can police an entire population. You already have a mass surveillance that can, that can identify faces of multiple people instantaneously. So we can either use narrow AI to fix problems like this, or we can use AI, narrow AI to exasperate problems like this. Now, I want us to look at how narrow AI is even made possible. What have what's going on under the hood, so to speak. The component at the heart of narrow, and narrow artificial intelligence is machine learning. Another name for machine learning is statistical learning. We'll come to this in a second. So how are machine learning and data science related to artificial intelligence? Well, machine learning is the, the set of techniques that make things like image recognition, voice recognition, natural language processing, et cetera, possible. The practice, the profession, that works on improving narrow AI and working with AI, narrow AI is data science. So data science is the profession, it is the, it is the set of practices and machine learning is a technique that is employed in this practice called data science, okay? In other words, machine learning is at the heart of data science. So let's talk about this practice data science briefly. Data science is an emerging field, okay? And more specifically, it has three main components. These are the pillars of data science, statistics and mathematics, computer science, and more specifically computer programming and what we call domain knowledge. Very quickly, uh, mathematics is just this science that has existed for thousands of years. Uh, computer programming is uh, how, we, how we instruct computers to do things like, uh, compute numbers or display pixels on a screen. And domain knowledge is uh, knowledge about a particular field. So for example, domain knowledge could be knowledge about sales, knowledge about healthcare, knowledge about finance, knowledge about banking, knowledge about automotive, and uh, you know, expertise that are not necessarily technical. So someone who's a data scientist must have these three. They must have a background in statistics and mathematics. They must know how to translate those statistical techniques with computer programming. And they must also know a thing or two about the domain in which they operate. So for example, you have to be a data scientist in a particular domain. A data scientist in the banking industry, a data scientist in the sales industry, a data scientist in, what's another example? Uh, aviation industry, you name it. So if you want to be an employable data scientist, not only must you have technical skills, but you also need to know how you can solve the problems in that domain with data and machine learning. Okay. So two, two more concepts, machine learning and big data. Machine learning and big data. What do these two mean and what do they have to do with data science? Okay. Now, we said that another name for machine learning is statistical learning, okay? Narrow AI 
all of the examples of narrow AI, image recognition, computer vision, voice recognition, natural language processing, all of this is made possible by machine learning. Okay, so at the heart of data science is machine learning. At the heart of machine learning is statistics and probability theory. Everything from machine, everything in machine learning is either directly derived from statistics and probability theory, or is it is exactly statistics and probability theory. Every word that you, you may have heard of machine learning, like regression, classification, clustering, all of these concepts are, like I said, either directly from probability theory and statistics or derived, inspired by statistics and probability theory, okay? So if statistics and probability theory has all of the techniques or has given us all the te techniques that we need for machine learning, why, do, why, do we, why don't we just all champion statistics and probability theory? Why do we always, why do we say you need to become a data scientist? Why is this thing uh, uh, so popular now? Statistics and probability theory do not tell us how to deal with large volumes of data, large volumes of digital data. In other words, big data, okay? Statistics and mathematics do not tell us how to work with, like I said, large volumes and large variety of digital data. That is the domain of computer science, okay? So if you want to handle volumes, large volumes of data that are being generated every second, every second we have uh, gigabytes, hundreds of gigabytes of data being generated in all variety from JPEGs to PNGs to text files to CSVs, even blobs, large object files. So we, we have these techniques that allow us to make inferences, to learn from data, but we can't, but, which is statistics, but we don't know how to deal with that. So this is where computer programming and statistics meet each other, okay? And of course we have domain knowledge. Now, there is more to machine learning and statistics and probability theory. In fact, machine learning automates a lot of redundant statistical techniques. So in machine learning, you are not solving equations by hand, rather you're representing those techniques with algorithms and you're having these algorithms run by the machine. Okay, so many of the statistical techniques like regression can be dealt with a single line or two of, of a programming uh, of a programming script. So now that we know what machine learning is, at least at the high level, let's look at the components of machine learning. So let's zoom in on this component. So we're going deeper and deeper still, okay? So we know what narrow AI is, its capabilities. We know at the heart of narrow AI is machine learning. So machine learning makes narrow artificial intelligence possible. But now let's, let's see what is at the heart of machine learning. Now, first of all, let me tell you about the five stages of the data science process. So every example that you've seen in the real world, like I said, recommendation systems on Spotify or video recommendations on Netflix and YouTube. Uh, all of these must, all of these can be accomplished if these five stages are processed. In data science, you must begin your, pro you must begin the process of data science by establishing goal. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? So let's take the example of COVID. We know that this disease has been spreading. We know that it is uh, problematic, but we must first determine, can data and machine learning solve problem? Can it contribute to controlling this problem? And the answer is yes. For example, we can, we can look at, uh, uh, we, can, we can take samples of patients, large samples of patients from all over the world and see what are the most recurring symptoms and how people re respond to vaccinations. Okay, so we can, we can see the whole picture. We can see how people are dealing with it. So definitely, yes, machine learning can help us uh, uh, fix problems in this, in this pandemic. So once we establish the, uh, the fact that we can solve a problem, we then have to go ahead and acquire data. Okay, this is where it's more, this is more statistical discipline. Statistics is the science of collecting and making inferences about data. But the data that you generate comes in a lot of variety. You, so we have 
like I said, even if we're looking at text files, we have different forms of text files from XML, TSV, CSV, JSON. And the data is not always clean. The data is not always something we can uh, pass on to the machine learning system. So we have to then process the data. In fact, for data scientists, the bulk of their time is spent collecting and processing data more than machine learning. Okay, and then once we have this machine learning, uh, once we reach the machine learning stage, we can then make inferences about the data. For example, what are the examples of making inferences from data? Let's say you're looking at uh, data from the data about property, property rates in Dubai. Machine learning can make inferences about future prices. Let's say you're a property developer and you want to know what is the potential price of this property. With this many bedrooms, with these amenities in this particular neighborhood, what could be the potential price of it? Machine learning can make inferences of that sort. Another example is if we take autonomous vehicles, autonomous vehicles, uh, that is to say self-driving cars, how can we program, how can we have this car, this vehicle, more specifically the algorithm that is operating this vehicle, identify an obstacle from a moving obstacle? Like if it's on the road, how can I tell this is a car that's about to move and this is a tree, it's a building, these are immovable objects. So this is a classification problem. This is what machine learning can help you do. And then from that on point, you can make a decision. And this can go two ways. You can either pass on this, the inferences to your customers. So for in the form of recommendation systems. So if you're someone who's Amazon, you can look at uh, products that are according to your preferences or no, you can use this uh, insight to make better decisions for your company. But let's explore machine learning specifically. Um, before I jump to this slide, let me tell you about the three types of machine learning that exist, three categories of machine learning. There is supervised learning, there is unsupervised learning, and there is reinforcement learning. Let me give you a quick example of these three. Supervised, the, the point of supervised learning is to find quantities. So supervised learning is facilitated mainly by regression. A regression is the ability or is a statistical technique that looks at existing data and it allows you to either fill in gaps or make inferences about future data. Then there's unsupervised learning. And the point of unsupervised learning is to find patterns where you cannot identify patterns. And reinforcement learning is about finding optimal actions in a particular environment. So for example, going back to that example of the autonomous vehicle, the way the model will learn what is the right decision, what is the wrong decision is to reinforce it by points. So for example, the way we train an autonomous vehicle is to put it in a simulated environment, like a three dimensional uh, road system, okay? If it runs into a building, then we will deduct from it a point if it stops at the red light, we will reward it with a point. And so with these point system, we will reward the model and the model will learn that, oh, these decisions will give me points, these decisions will make, uh, give me bad points. And we can monitor the model. We can see if, if it makes a, a significant, significantly better decision, then it's, it, th th this model is able to, we can, you can use it in the real world. Then we have something called deep learning. Deep learning is made possible by something we call neural networks. And neural networks are, let's say, mathematical representations of the human brain. So the human brain is made up these very simple components we call neurons. Okay? The way we process, the way we process thoughts is that we have electric signals going through these neurons and then these neurons are connected to each other in different patterns. And when we have a chain of neurons connected to each other, sending signals back and forth, we are processing ideas. So when you sleep and you're having dreams, you're sending electric signals down this network of neurons. Here's how neural networks work. And by the way, neural networks is the 
best form of machine learning that we have at this point. So if you remember that spectrum where we had narrow AI, general AI, and super AI, the best form of narrow AI we have currently is because of deep learning. And at the heart of deep learning is the system we have called neural networks. And what we try to, what we try to do here is replicate the best of our abilities, the human neuron. So if we, of course, there's a lot we don't know about the human brain, but we know, we, we know, we know a certain amount about the human neuron and how they work collectively. So we try to we try to create a softer simulation of the human neuron. So if you look at this diagram below, if that's the if that's a drawing of a human neuron, you have these dendrites which receive signals. You have a nucleus which processes signals, which travel down this axon, and we have these terminals. And from the terminals, you're connected to more neurons. This is how you are able to collect information. Now. This is only a simplified version. You have these source of input. Then you have this nucleus, which we call the perceptron. And then whatever that, what that, whatever that is, it produces an output, which travels down this axon onto more perceptrons. If you take multiple of these, what do we call these perceptrons? If that's a neuron, we call the softer replication of that a perceptron. If we, if we take multiple neurons together, we get a human uh, brain. If we put multiple perceptrons, multiple perceptrons together, we get a neural network. This is a mathematical uh, representation of the above. So this is the same thing, except it is just showing you uh, how it works mathematically. But if we, like I said, if we take these and put them into a network, we get this, a neural network. All of these nodes in this picture represent those perceptrons. So these are neurons. It's a, that's a neuron, that's a neuron, that's a neuron. Now, every single neuron, every single, I should say, perceptron, its nucleus is a simple mathematical function. Every single perceptron here is a mathematical function, which is, if I can jump ahead for a moment, it comes down to this, solving equations. So machine learning is about solving equations and all the mathematical subjects related to solving an equation of that form. So what I just showed you here is a simple linear regression model. Okay. Now, if I can jump ahead, if I can uh, go above for a second. These are those examples of machine learning. So even though I, so even though this is machine learning here. When we say narrow AI, we're really talking about these applications from recognizing the face and the expression of the face to identifying objects in an image, what's on the foreground, what's the background, what's moving, what's not moving. The example of the autonomous vehicle, that's also an application of machine learning and optical character recognition. So identifying uh, what is a, what is a cat, what's, what, uh, what's a cat, what's an alphabet, what, what's a, excuse me, what's a letter, what's a number from sketches on a piece of paper. Okay, this is narrow artificial intelligence. This is where we are, are currently. These are the only things we can do. And narrow AI is made possible because of machine learning. And to recap, these are the three types of machine learning you can do. Like I said, they're supervised learning. So you would choose one or the other depending on your chosen outcome. If you predict quantities, you would use supervised learnings. If you're looking for patterns that you, can, you cannot otherwise identify, you use unsupervised learning. And if you want to train a model to make, to take uh, correct decisions, that is reinforcement learning. So quickly, examples of supervised learning include uh, predicting prices of uh, properties, detecting future numbers of outbreaks of a disease, predicting future number of uh, visitors to a city like in Dubai. Examples of unsupervised learning. Let's say you have different variants of the COVID virus, but you don't know how many. You have the data in front of you, but you simply cannot count them because just because of the sheer volume of the data. Unsupervised learning can use statistical techniques, clustering in particular, to find the categories, the number of categories that exist. So you can identify the number of variations. 
of the COVID virus. Or let's say, uh, an let's take an example in, in business. Okay, you want to know how many customers you have. How many ways can you categorize and segment your customers? By age, by income, by uh, their profession, by their, prof the, the, their uh, uh, purchase preferences. Okay, you may have people from a mix of, uh, um, let's say, they, they may have different degrees of purchase power. They can be low income and high income, but they prefer to buy the same thing. And you want to know what, 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 how can we segment them better so we can go to the, so we can target the best market segment. Reinforcement learning, autonomous speakers is one example which I've repeated, but others include uh, trading algorithms. If you, right, so stocks and bonds are bought algorithm, algorithmically in split seconds. And you can train a model to buy the right stocks and to sell stocks at the right time uh, by way of reinforcement learning. And deep learning, which I just told you about, can do all three of these. Deep learning, which I told you at the heart of, at the heart of is, is neural networks, can do all three of these. You can have it predict quantities. You can have it identify patterns. You can, always, you can also have it find uh, the optimal actions. Okay. Now let me, uh, yes. And also one more th slide I wanna show you. The difference between computer programming or rules-based system and machine learning. So what preceded machine learning was traditional programming. If any of you are familiar with programming, we have what we call control statements, like if and else, while loops, for loops. That is what makes traditional programming possible. And here's how it works. You, the programmer, write the rules then the program will take on arguments. And based on the rules that you specified, it will output answers. So for example, a very simple example is a login, login screen. If, if, here's the keyword, if the user types in the correct email and password, they get the right combination, then their status is logged in. And naturally, if they write, enter the incorrect, incorrect combination, they will get the wrong answer. But how this algorithm must decide will depend on the rules that you've specified. So you must write down all the rules. In machine learning, you want to do things differently. We want to tell the machine what the correct answers are, and we want to expose it to data, but we want the machine to identify the rules. Okay? So for example, we want the machine to know uh, what is a malignant tumor, and we want to show it data. And we want the machine to find out what makes that skin or, or, that, or that demarcation on the skin malignant. What is it? What is it about that particular pigmentation or demarcation that makes it malignant? This is, a, this is, a, this is definitely a problem uh, for, uh, uh, you know, for at least in the realm of skin cancer. Many... Uh, what do you call it? Um, I don't know what the medical word is, but many th things that appear on your skin are uh, diagnosed as benign. And then later it turns out it was no, it was not benign, it was, it was malignant. And of course, you can imagine why that would be problematic. So we can train the machine to be more effective at identifying uh, Malignant, uh, malignant tumors, better at detecting faces, expressions on faces, and uh, figure out what is it? What, what are those parameters that make such a thing true? What is, what, what is it that makes uh, someone susceptible to diabetes? What is it that makes someone uh, or, or susceptible to skin cancer? What is it that makes a good investment? What's a good stock? What's a bad stock? So you can you can you can you can have the machine learn the parameters, and then once you know what those parameters are, you can use it to make better decisions. Okay. Now, let me go to the, let me start at the top.
because I think we went a little too fast. And we do have 25 minutes left. So I want to uh, start here. And let me see if you have any questions. So the kind of questions I want to invite, I invite you to ask are about applications of narrow AI, which is really machine learning. Questions about becoming a data scientist. So if you're someone who's considering transitioning to this role and questions that uh, may not have been addressed in this workshop. And for those who are on Zoom, you can even unmute, unmute, unmute your microphone if you want to ask. So I want to make this interactive and I'll try to answer it with the slides that we have here. Otherwise, I'll just try to answer it any way I can. So I think I think when I when I counted, half of you wanted to become data scientists, right? Any questions about that? Your starting journey, where you should start, you should start from? Like uh, I don't know where from where I can start. I just I want it and I have little little bit of information. And I from these I have a little bit computer programming skills. And I don't know how it, what is the next step of it. Okay. So for someone who's who's new to data science, data science and is considering transitioning to this to the role of a data science to data science. Now, by the way, I most point this out: if you do join a company that has a data science team, you will fall into two categories: that of a data scientist or a data engineer. Okay. So let me put that put that put that on the side first. If you want to become a data scientist, like I said, you need to know these three things. Okay, you need to uh, learn computer programming. You definitely, definitely need to know statistics and probability theory. I can talk about the difference of the two uh, in a second. But, you, but also you must apply those technical skills to a particular domain, okay? So there are plenty of people who do have this technical background, but they do not know much about a particular domain. The desired domain you want to work on. Exactly. So if you want to use data science to, to solve, you know, problems with, with COVID or uh, epidemiology to begin or in general, you must understand how these, these are spread. Okay. So many people say, all right, I, 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 uh, if it's too late for me to study data science. I should have started many years ago. I should have learned programming before. I should have learned these before. Uh, what are the chances I can make it now? Well, if you're someone who has experience outside of statistics and math and computer programming, you already have an advantage. You must have spent three years, five years, 10 years, 15 years, whatever, in a, in, a, in a separate domain, in sales, in marketing, in the automotive industry, in the hospitality industry. So if you're someone who knows a great deal about that domain, I can, you, from the top of your, at the top of your head, you can probably produce a long list of problems that exist. From operations, to customers, to anything in the industry. And you can probably perceive or imagine how uh, automation and data could solve those problems. So if, you, if you're coming from outside, if you don't have this technical background, you already have an advantage versus someone who, let's say, is just entering college to learn this for the first time. Okay? So you, as, as a working professional, already have an advantage over someone who is in university and is learning, and is learning statistics. Or is, or is learning math and computer program. So cons assuming you already have domain knowledge, the next thing you want to learn, and you want to learn these simultaneously, like you cannot become an expert in computer programming and then start becoming an expert in statistics and probability theory. You want to learn enough programming that will allow you to uh, write scripts for machine learning. So uh, I don't think I don't know if I have it in here, but there are six programming constructs. If you want, you can take a note of that. There are six things you must know about your programming language of choice. And by the way, when it comes to data science, the programming language is Python. Okay, Python is a general purpose programming language, and when it comes to data science, it is it is a dominant language. It is the most popular popular language. The six programming constructs are variables. That's the first thing you can learn and they're quite easy to learn. You then have functions. 
Then you have data types. You then have data structures. This is uh, a quite important. If, if you do ever apply for a job as a data scientist, they're going to test you for two things. Obviously your knowledge of statistics and probability theory, and then your knowledge of data, data structures, especially if you're gonna be a data engineer. I'll tell you more about that in a second. So you have data, data types, data structures. Then you have uh, objects, and then something closely related to objects, and I'd say the most advanced programming construct of the all classes. So if you've heard of object-oriented programming, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's classes and objects that have to do with that topic. So you want to master, you want to master, master these six. So uh, more important than which library we work on or which ID you work on, it is the mastery of these six programming constructs. And these are, these are quite easy to pick up if, if you dedicate uh, every day to learning this, you can possibly learn this in, in two or three weeks, the programming constructs. What is more challenging to learn, however, is statistics and probability theory. Now, statistics is more of a science than a mathematical branch. Uh, so, I wish to, so to, to, to put it correctly, statistics depends on probability theory. Many people can start with machine learning easily, but very soon they plateau. Like they reach a point where they cannot make progress because they will come across terms and algorithms that they cannot make sense of. And they cannot make sense of it because the algorithm or the terminology that they're looking at is, is, is terminology, like I said, from probability theory. Probability theory in turn is challenging because it depends on other mathematical subjects. So statistics depends on probability theory. Probability theory in turn depends on other mathematical subjects. Subjects like single variable calculus, differentiation integration. Then you've got uh, number theory, not all of number theory, but uh, certain topics from number theory. You have set theory. Then you have, uh, let's see, the basic ones. So I talked about differential integration. I told you about the sequence, sequence series. That's also calculus. Um, set notation, combinatorics, combinatorics. So things like permutations, com combinations. And once you get into the more advanced level, like more advanced uh, probability theory, and there are many problems that require probably, in fact, if you want to get into neural networks, you will encounter differential equations. So you would need differential equations in the context of probability theory. And then, if and then if we and, and then uh, if we if you're dealing with uh, multiple samples of data, you will also encounter matrices, which means you need to learn linear algebra. So if I can summarize what I just said, you would have to learn these six mathematical topics in that order. So you can start with elementary probability theory, but then. If you want to continue progressing, you have to learn single variable calculus. Okay, so you want to understand differentiation and the difference between definite and indefinite integrals. From that point, you can proceed to multivariable calculus and uh, you will encounter linear algebra, especially if you want to work with neural, neural networks. Linear and neural networks uh, are basically matrix operations. So linear algebra. Uh, and then, but we're not in, in, in neural networks, we're not just confined to two dimensional matrices, or we go to three dimensional, four dimensional matrices, uh, and then an and a generalization of a matrix is what we call a tensor. Some of you may have heard of TensorFlow, which is a library that allows you to work with multi dimensional arrays, multi dimensional matrices, like a three, like imagine a cube. Okay, that cube thing we call a tensor. So you have to be familiar with the notation at least. Uh, and then you'll be working with, with differential equations. So for example, in, in, in uh, neural networks, 
we uh, are trying to optimize. We have something called optimization. And uh, to understand optimization, uh, we need to understand this concept of a gradient and solving gradients, which is something you learn in differential equations. And then you can go beyond that. It's like, it's, there's no ceiling. If you want to uh, add new, if you want to advance deep learning, let's say you want to become data scientist with, with the intention of expanding it, making it better, like pushing the envelope, so to speak. There are many more mathematical disciplines to learn. Now, obviously for someone who has not, does not have a background in mathematics, someone who does not have a degree in mathematics or does not have a degree in engineering, when you see something like this, it's intimidating. Like the first one alone is probably intimidating to you, right? If, if you haven't, if you have not studied this since college or you've never studied this to begin with, when you see this, you go, oh my goodness. Cross me, cross my name off the list. How many of you have tried programming? Okay. Um, the other half who has not tried, who has not done programming. It's hard for me to convince you without showing you, but I can tell you that it is something you can learn in a short span of time. Okay, bear with me. There's a, there's a reason why uh, I'm talking about programming when we're looking at mathematics. Even in our coding bootcamp, we have people who are absolute beginners and we're able to teach them those six program construct in two weeks. Okay, and there are, we, we give them breaks, they have weekends, so it's not that intensive, but they can learn in two weeks. Now, for those of you who uh, do have experience with programming, it might sound strange for me to say you this, but say this to you, but mathematics is more intuitive than programming. Okay, you might you might disagree, and I would have disagreed with you several years ago. Uh, and you know, when you do programming, and I'm telling you this for those of you who have, who have done programming, you've, you've, you've written functions, you've written control statements, you've worked variables, all of these six programming constructs, these six programming constructs are actually mathematics. Four loops are from mathematics. Variables are from mathematics. Functions that you write, it's in the name, it's mathematics. In fact, we had, I, I came across someone who had a PhD in mathematics and they said, programming is hard for me. So how can you say that? How can you say that programming is more difficult than mathematics? And the reason, this is the reason why mathematics is difficult. The concepts are very intuitive, meaning any human being can make sense of it. There are some things that not every human being can do, like run fast like Usain Bolt or jump high like Michael Jordan. But there are some things we can all do. And that is mathematics. But why is it difficult to learn? Why, why, why do you think, why would you disagree with me? Because there are two problems with mathematics. There are two problems with learning mathematics. The first one is notation, right? Unlike programming, where things, like, things are spelled out, mathematics use letters. F of X, G of X.
Hello, uh, Amir. I think we lost Danny. For those two people who, who, who decided to stay here, well done. My, my laptop uh, ran out of battery. Right, so here, what I was saying, yes. Let me tell you about those two problems with learning mathematics. The first one is notation. You know, when you, if you pick up a textbook, uh, let's say probability theory, okay? The author assumes you know what those letters and sh those characters mean, okay? They will approach it, the, what we call introductory probability or introductory statistics, but they assume you already know what those characters mean because you've picked it up in your university course or somewhere else. So they don't, um, occasionally they may have an appendix to help you, but in most cases they do not. That's the first barrier. If you're not able to mix, if you're not able to tell, for example, what's, why a, a letter is bold or italic, why a character is Latin or Greek, there's in statistics, it's a big difference between using a Greek letter and a Latin letter. Uh, and there's a reason why you would use the other, one or the other. Or why you would use ABC instead of XYZ. For example, in mathematics, when you want to represent constants, numbers that are fixed, we use letters from the start of the alphabet. A, B, C, and if we start running out, we go D, E, F. And if you want to represent variable, variables, which are things that will change, we go X, Y, Z, and if necessary, we can go a, a little bit before X. There's a difference, there's a reason why we'd use an uppercase letter or a lowercase letter. So if you're someone who does not have exposure to mathematics, you might uh, think that it's the same thing. Uppercase X, lowercase X, bold X, italic X, doesn't make a difference, but it makes a huge difference. But the significance of this uh, is supposed to be known to you or it's assumed that you already know the significance of these characters. That's the first challenge. The second challenge is terminology. When you're reading a text, let's say you, are, you have a book in front of you or even if you're listening to a video on YouTube, you're listening to certain words and you think that, or you, 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 do, not, I, you do not recognize that certain terminology have a specific meaning. These are not words from English in general, but they have a simple meaning. So for example, in statistics, we have a word called population. When we hear the word population, we assume human beings. But in statistics, population is not confined just to people. It can be a population of anything. If we talk, it, it refers to a collection of the same thing. So for example, if we talk about the population of smartphones, 
or the, all of the smartphones, there will be the population of smartphones, population of sunglasses, population of elephants. Uh, or for example, in statistics and probability, we have two words that sound very similar, but they have nothing to do with each other. For example, in statistics, we have a word called sample. In probability theory, we have something called sample space. And if you, it is natural for us human beings to think sample, sample space, they must be related to each other. They're not. So not knowing the definition of a word is yet another obstacle. The concepts are not difficult. Like your brain is equipped to make sense of it, but it is the characters that get in the way. You know, an analogy I use is this. I'm gonna assume that no one understands Japanese writing, okay? If you do, let's assume we don't. And let's say we, we take a very simple piece of information, like uh, a children's story. Children's story, like, uh, I don't know, the Red Riding Hood or the Boy Who Cried Wolf. We all know this. If I were to write that story down with Japanese letters and I would show it to you, you would not make sense of it. You know the story, the story, even a three-year-old kid can make sense of the story, but the characters are getting in the way of you absorbing the information. So if you wanna really accelerate your learning journey and not be intimidated by mathematics is to first have some sort of glossary of characters. This characters means this, this character this, this letter refers to that definition. This letter refers to that function. This letter refers to that thing. That can really make it easier for you. You must train your eye, so to speak, to detect a bold letter, italic letter, Greek letter, Latin letter. Uh, for uh, Another problem in mathematics is, for example, when, the, when you're looking at functions, they leave out the parentheses. They assume you know this is a function, so they leave out the parentheses. If you do not know these conventions, once again, that's going to be a barrier. Okay. And so to summarize, start learning Python, master those six programming constructs, and then start learning what we call descriptive statistics. So statistics can be broken into two parts. Descriptive statistics, which is how you use visualization, like frequency charts, scatter plots, to, to visualize data. And then you go into inferential statistics where you look at the shape and you can identify the statistical techniques to make inferences about that data. So in that order, you wanna learn descriptive statistics so you, so you, know, you have some exposure to the terminology and then from there you wanna go on to inferential, inferential statistics. And then you wanna learn probability theory, okay? If you, once you start to learn probability theory, these are the things you have to know. You need to understand uh, differentiation, integration, sequence and series and um, it's actually a long list I would uh, list what I think I should do is after this workshop is over email everyone there's a handbook I have a handbook as of reference I think it's best if I should have with you so yes first learn programming the element descriptive statistics then probability theory to the extent that it's possible and from the inferential statistics. And do not ever discount your expertise, experience, your domain knowledge. If you have domain knowledge, believe me, there are many companies who want you. In fact, they, want, they would want someone who has some of these technical uh, techniques, but has a lot of domain knowledge more than someone who has little or no domain knowledge, but they have a great experience with these two, okay? Unless you're developing a machine learning model, you want to have someone, you want to be, have domain knowledge, okay? So I know that was a long answer, but I hopefully most of you uh, could have benefit. Any, any, so I know we're running out of time, but does anyone have another question? How about those Zoom, any other questions? First, you said the, the difference between data analysis and data engineering. Data science is the danger. So very quickly, a data scientist is, is, is statistician. You're a statistician who uses programming to perform statistical techniques. So they must be a master of this part. If they are using a machine learning model, they must know, they must be able to interpret the metrics. That's another, that's another technical term, metrics, and uh, how to choose the appropriate machine learning model. So they have to know how that machine learning model works. Like what is the mathematical representation of that model? I did, but, but 
you know, uh, someone who has a lot of experience with statistics uh, will not know a great deal about uh, data engineering. So there's more to data engineering than programming. Uh, you must, you, there's a library called Apache Spark. You may wanna note that. So when it comes to big data, this technology is the king of dealing with big data. It's called Apache Spark. Uh, you need to know more about, you need to know more than just programming concepts. You do need to, you, it's more of a computer science discipline than it is a statistical discipline. And in a, in a real company where you have a team of, where you have a data science team, you need these two people. You need people who are statisticians by training or applied mathematicians by training and people who are, uh, who know how to work with Python and shell scripting and they understand the cloud. They know, they know how to work with Apache, uh, Apache uh, uh, Spark. One very in demand skill is SQL. Knowing how to query data from a database and the different variations of databases. So uh, both of these roles are required. Both of these uh, roles are required. And you may like one or the other, but you should know that these options exist. Any other questions? Applications, more about data science as a career, learning journey. Hey, Denny, uh, this is no? Syed from Zoom. Yes. I'm not ghost. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, I, I do See, have a question, okay, so which is very specific. There is no, there is no finish line because this is an emerging field. It, it keeps on expanding and expanding. Um, so let me, let, me, let me rephrase your question. How long will it take to apply to work with, let's say these essential, these more elementary machine learning applications, if I can scroll down here. And I will use our bootcamp as an example, because that is something we've tried and tested. So we've seen the results. In our data science bootcamp, we get people to learn who have no programming background. They don't have no mathematical background, like those six mathematical subjects are highlighted. They know none of that. And they have no programming experience. We get them to learn those programming constructs all the way to learning with advanced Python libraries to working on projects that have to do with supervising and unsupervising. We do this in a span of two months. And if you wanna see them do this, we have on our YouTube channel, the demo day. These are people uh, from different backgrounds, not technical backgrounds, who are practicing supervised learning and unsupervised learning in, in a span of two months. So uh, the shortest time frame that I know is two months because that's the program we have. But we don't cover things like reinforcement learning. But we do cover neural networks, by the way. We do, they also learn neural networks, which is quite advanced. But we don't do reinforcement learning. There's a lot of mathematics that we do not cover. We have one week. If the, the, the bootcamp is eight weeks long, we leave the last week for advanced mathematics. So we introduce them to these topics. But we put, we put emphasis on the notation. Because if you learn the notation, if you understand how to, if, you, if you're able to identify a differential equations, a differential equation from a non-differential equation, linear regression from non-linear regression, uh, what's a vector and what's a variable, then you can independently learn on your own. If you have a foundation, you can use that foundation to continue learning advanced topics and not get stuck. So that is my answer to you. Very good, everyone. If you do have any questions after today's workshop, you can reach out to me uh, you can reach out to me on this email. Um, yes, do keep your eye out on the meetup for the subsequent workshop. We will go more, we will go into more depth with data science. And I want to thank you for joining me today. Sorry for that little glitch. And I hope to see you again soon. Take care and bye-bye. Thank you. I have this book and I love it.